Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Faranini Binti Dusoki to present her lecture. For your info, Dr. Farah is the Children's Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, Suhaka, as well as the Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Law. Please welcome. Just because you are homegrown, yeah, or rather at home, huh, you can get all this nonsense. Huh? <laughs> anyway, uh, coming after Cecile is going to be a challenge. <clears throat> Cecile? Yes. Coming after you is going to be a challenge. Oh. With all the videos and all the colourful slides, and mine will be a, a typical law lecturer <laughs> slides. Words and words and words. Anyway, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Hazrina, for inviting me, although I think she should be the one standing behind the microphone now. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is actually a new topic to me. I've not been asked to speak uh, on both women and children and on the role of Suhakam. Um, so I'll do my best. My slides were ready only at nine today. Um, so without further ado, I want to start with a story of E-K-R-A-N-D. Obviously not their real uh, initials. These are five girls from Pontianak, Indonesia who Suhakam team spoke to um, and they narrated how they had been brought from their homeland to Malaysia. They had been promised jobs as house helps, pembantu rumah, and upon arrival at KLIA, had been taken to an apartment in Cheras and found themselves locked in an apartment. The next day, they were forced to entertain men from 12 p.m. to 6 a.m. the following morning. Food was brought to them twice a day. A week later, they were taken from Cheras to Pahang. They were sold to another agent in Pahang who then took them to a housing estate in Sungai Buloh where construction work was in progress. Here, they were handed over to a Bangladeshi whom they had to call captain who brought Bangladeshi, Nepalese, and Chinese men to be entertained by them. When they complained of being tired, they were beaten. They would then pass on to another agent who put them in a hotel in Subang Jaya. They endured their plight for seven months. They received no payment whatsoever. One day, the agent told them to run as there was a police raid. They were arrested and were sent to the Semenye Detention Center. This is only one of the many stories that have been taking place over the years. Now, trafficking for sexual exploitation is one of the most lucrative criminal enterprises in the world, estimated to be worth almost $99 billion a year. According to the Global Report on Trafficking in Persons, conducted by UN ODC in 2020, globally, one in every three victims of human trafficking is a child, mainly girls. Now, this is the most scary statistic for us today, I feel. You know, one in three, that's huge, isn't it? Female victims continue to be the primary targets of human and child trafficking. Um, my slides can be shared. And you can go further to all these uh, links to, to read further. Oops, can't seem to move this. Jahid? Gosh, hang on. I think I got to take the link, yeah. Uh, hang on, yeah. Okay. I think I've got to use it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so that's it for a brief recap, yeah? So it's an introduction. On one of its visits to Kajang Women's Prison in January 2003, I'm taking you way back then, before we had the Atip Song, the, the act in Malaysia. Suhakam observed a large number of foreign nationals, mainly young girls, in Reman, in the prison. During the conversations with some of the girls, Suhakam found that many of these girls were actually tricked and trafficked into the country. 
They had been lured and coerced with promises of jobs as home help in supermarkets or restaurants with lucrative incomes. Usual story, isn't it? But inevitably ended up in a pernicious flash trade, often against their will. Now, trafficking in women and children is definitely the worst form of violation of the human rights of women and children. It's one of the greatest human rights challenges of our time. And aside from being a cross violation of human rights, trafficking threatens the world community by allowing a safe haven for trafficked syndicates, funding illicit activities, and facilitating the spread of sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV AIDS. A characteristic of trafficking is that the victim is restricted in her freedom of choice. And that encompasses everything else, isn't it? Movement, freedom of everything. And this is why it is often called a modern day slavery. And it has no borders involving both developing and developed countries and has become an organized transnational crime and an increasing booming global business. So I'm sure you've heard this during these two days. What is trafficking in persons? It is the illicit and clandestine movement of persons across national and international borders, largely, sadly, from developing countries and some countries with economics in transition with the end goal of forcing women and ch girl children into sexually or economically oppressive and exploitative situations for the traffickers, such as forced domestic labor, false marriages, clandestine employment, and false adoption. Now, that's the saddest one. And exploitation includes, at a minimum, the exploitation of the prostitution of others or other forms of sexual exploitation, forced labor or services, slavery or practices similar to slavery, servitude, or the removal of organs. And this happens to many, many children. Women and children, young girls and boys, are trafficked, marketed, transported, and sold by traffickers to be exploited in prostitution, pornography, and forced bonded labor for sex tourism, domestic and construction work, and to work in factories and other sites of work in the formal and informal economy. And they are often trafficked for begging, for organ trade, drug peddling, camel jockeying, and adoption as well. Now, we've heard stories whereby children who are lost in Malaysia suddenly found in uh, Thailand or Indonesia, and sadly maimed. Maksudnya kudung, ya? Tak kira tangan, atau to use for purposes of begging. And human trafficking, sadly and disproportionately, affects women, girls, and children. Now, understanding that this complex issue is that the intersection of different forms of discrimination, such as poor economic conditions, race, and gender norms, continue to have a significant impact on the dynamics behind child trafficking. This is the one fact that we need to accept first, that it does happen to this category of people and in the most unfair situations. So, after all this, in Suhakam, the subcommittee was then formed to look into this issue of grave importance. So the work has begun. Suhakam was established in 1999, and not very long after, this issue came to their attention in 2003. So a series of dialogues between Suhakam and various groups throughout 2003 and early 2004. So there was a pre-dialogue meeting, there was a roundtable dialogue. The pre-dialogue meeting was, of course, among themselves. Then the roundtable dialogue involved people from the multiple stakeholders in Malaysia itself, but within the government agencies. Then they moved on to have dialogues with NGOs, you know, people like Cecile just now, to really understand what really is the situation on the ground. And then the fourth dialogue was at international level, done in Malaysia, whereby they invited representatives from the various embassies, remember, this is a transnational uh, you know, crime, from Indonesia, from Russia, from Thailand, from Cambodia, from Vietnam, the Philippines, China, and Myanmar. And these dialogues culminated in a very important forum on trafficking of women and children, which brings as its theme a cross-border and regional perspective. This is one area whereby we cannot be on our own. This is one area whereby we need to work with other state countries. So this was conducted on the 10th, 13th and 14th April, sorry, I think it was 13th and 14th April 2004, 
uh, at the Prince Hotel. I'm not sure what hotel now it is. I'm pretty sure that it has changed names uh, multiple times. But what I do know is that it is the very hotel that is opposite uh, Pavilion. And um, at the front, it is actually opposite the current Royal Chulan. Do you have an idea now? It's somewhere you've given that. Okay. And Malaysia seemed, and I added there, seems, because I still think Malaysia uh, is somehow attractive to other countries, to be an attractive country for foreign women from both near and far, from our ASEAN neighbours to as far as the African and European continent. These women have heard of success stories, displays of wealth and remittance sent back home from relatives and friends working abroad, which is a powerful incentive for other girls and women to seek jobs in this country. And the findings, just to, you know, in a very simplified mode, the findings of the forum are as follows. It was definitely agreed that they need to be bilateral and regional cooperation to combat trafficking. The role of embassies cannot be overemphasized. Setting up of a national task force on trafficking, which stays on until now, culminated into what we have now, MAPO. Ratification of the UN protocol on trafficking, at that point of time, you know, it wasn't. Quicker, proactive and stringent action by enforcement authorities, still a problem until today. The role of NGOs and community empowerment, I believe this has grown multifold. We have definitely more NGOs working on this now and role of the tourism industry. Decriminalization of victims of trafficking. Now, this took a huge change of mindset because victims of trafficking were often looked at as offenders. You see? So there, is a, there was and there is still an ongoing need to decriminalize the victims of trafficking because they really are the victims. Repatriation and reintroduction of traffic victims. That was what... You know, Cecile was talking about partially, isn't it? That, you know, it's very important to get them back, you know, to where they belong and hopefully where they want to be because where they belong may not be where they want to be, right? And most importantly, reintegration of these traffic victims. You know, you look at the five girls from Pontiana. Look at how many times they were sold and resold. How many places they had to move you know, from one to the other. The local policy needs to, needed to be established because that, remember that was the first forum, huge forum ever. Review of the laws certainly was needed and indeed it culminated into the ATIP SOM in 2007, uh, an anti-trafficking act, the need to raise awareness. And I think this is so still much ongoing. And best practices of other countries, definitely. And I know this has got no full stop. There's always something new to learn simply because the borders are getting, you know, more and more fluid. And of course, most importantly, like everything else, the need for political will. So what do we know now? That no type of trafficking is more serious or harmful than another. You know, they all disempower the people who are subjected to it and can leave devastating physiological and psychological impacts. Gender vulnerabilities in relation to rigid social norms increase the possibility of human trafficking. I cannot overemphasize this because this also happens in other forms of vulnerabilities. And consequently, child trafficking because of this <coughs> deeply sated, you know, social and cultural embedded practices and beliefs. This means that certain groups of people such as women, girls and children are more vulnerable to these harmful crimes. Gender norms rooted in stereotypical, uh, stereotypical social roles, power imbalances, religious beliefs, and limited access to justice can lead to the normalization of harmful forms of physical possession, such as child sexual exploitation and child trafficking for sexual purposes. Child marriage is one of the indicators, isn't it not? And oftentimes, you know, they think that by marrying it off, it's actually helping the child due to poverty, whatever. It is now an indicator for trafficking in persons. The gender dimension of child trafficking affects boys too. Let's not forget about the boys. You know, sometimes the focus is so much on the girl that we forget that it affects boys maybe just as bad. 
Gender norms play a key role in child trafficking and most of the resources and research around child tra trafficking are currently focused on girls. Whilst it is extremely important to acknowledge that the numbers, statistics clearly show that there are more girls than boys, right? But it is also true that trafficking remains a challenging issue to report and monitor as a lot of data is lost and unavailable. It is not hard to imagine that child trafficking in relation, in relation to boys and young men is more difficult to detect. Also the stigmatization that takes place, you know, like, oh, you know, I'll be not man enough if I were to report this or tell somebody this. And therefore they leave it in, embedded within that. The global discourse surrounding human trafficking often cites boys being trafficked for the purpose of forced labor only. Whilst it is true that boys are more, more vulnerable to forced labor, it is also important to note that they may also be victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation purposes, especially now, isn't it? When there is this increase in normalization of what used to be not so common. UNODC's 2020 Global Report on Trafficking in Persons found that out of 2,065 boy victims of trafficking detected in 106 countries, 23%, that is around almost 500 boys, were identified to be victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation. And research shows that in countries where many children are victims of trafficking, these are also countries where child labor is more prevalent. And, and I have to admit this, that child labor is one of the least research area in the country because it is not easy to penetrate the estate, you know, to get actual information because of the complexity of the issues. I have met boys, you know, in Henry Gurney, in Tunas Bhakti, who look like they're only 10 or 11 years old, but in reality, they are 15 or 16, but stunted because of doing heavy work since very small, you see? So that is why it is difficult, isn't it? When you see them, you know, you think, them, you think of them as a particular age, but really the actual data will show you otherwise. So that's why we really, really need data. Children are sold for different reasons and their gender is closely related to the type of trafficking they are victims of. For example, girls are exploited or trafficked for commercial sexual exploitation and also to act as domestic servants, while boys are usually trafficked for manual labor and sexual purposes. Over the years, the rising adoption, and this is so crucial now, of technological devices and the globalization of movements have allowed people and children to easily move between countries, thus making it easier for the, perpetrator, for, for the perpetrators to commit human and child trafficking crimes. So what next? Now, despite most countries have existing anti-trafficking laws in place, Trafficking is very often framed as a cross-border and movement security issue rather than a human rights issue. And this is certainly one of the most challenging role of Suhaka. It is to make people look at issues from the lens of human rights. This approach of looking at as a cross-border and movement security rather than a human rights issue fails to encompass the needs of trafficking victims with national policies prioritizing rates and prosecuting officers instead of focusing on identifying victims and providing them with support services. So I'm sure you've heard from yesterday that identification of victims is one of the main challenges. So whilst you have all this interim protection order and what have you, it's the identification of victims which is actually very hard to do. You know, How do you really identify that one is a victim or otherwise? All countries and governments should adopt a victim-centered approach within anti-trafficking national policies to ensure that both adult and child survivors receive adequate support. Specifically, countries need to address the different nature of vulnerability that children face, such as child sexual exploitation. So you see how crucial the role of super society, for example, you know, because governments certainly cannot do everything. Can you imagine the government agency is actually doing what Cecilia is doing? and that of a friend, you know, actually taking the time to do all the play therapies, you know, things that seem to be insignificant and petty, but really those are the most crucially needed by the victims. Now at the regional level, of course, when you have a problem that's transnational in nature, you need to work within your neighboring countries first and foremost. 
So at the regional level, we have the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, you have the ASEAN Declaration Against Trafficking in Persons, particularly Women and Children, adopted in 2004, and you have all these links which I don't want to read, but you also now have the ASEAN Conve Convention Against Trafficking in Persons, which is popularly known as the APTI. So that's why you see our, you know, the prime ministers of the different ASEAN states often talk when they talk about TIP, they will talk about ACTI. Because this is what is actually bind, you know, binding the different ASEAN states. And with this, there is also the ASEAN plan of action against trafficking in persons, especially women and children. And I was privileged in 2017 up till 2000 and early 2019 to be part of the ASEAN team to draft the guidelines for the protection of victims of tape, women and children. That's very important because uh, every state needs to identify, you know, what are the pecul peculiar needs. And while some countries are both destination countries and receiving countries, you know, but not all states are of the same nature. We are mostly a country that receives more than going out, I hope. I mean, that's what data shows at the moment. But like I said, because data is not conclusive, right? So we don't really know, but, but at the moment that is. I remember when, you know, when, when, when uh, one of the meetings, the meetings was of course done uh, at different, different um, cities. At one of the meetings in, in um, Jakarta, Singapore said, no, we don't want to have any role in this because we are neither both countries. Yeah, because they are a small country, isn't it? They can afford to have really, really strict Borders which are closed. Ours is so fluid. If you go to Kelantan, my hometown, you just go to Pengkalan Kubo, the river is actually nearer from here to that wall there. A kid can actually go to the next border. There is really no strict restrictions. And of course, it's always easier to go via motorbike and all that, isn't it? That is how easy it is. And the signing of ACTIP and its future implementation into domestic law is regarded as an important step in developing a stronger legislative framework for combating human trafficking within the ASEAN member states. The ACTIP will be it's implemented along with the ASEAN Plan of Action, which I spoke just now, but there remain several questions surrounding its enforceability. You know, how do you really enforce it? Monitoring of its compliance by states and by ASEAN and the resolution of conflicts between national laws and the provisions of ACTI. So the mechanism that I see working for women and children at the moment at ASEAN level will be the ASEAN Commission for the Protection and Promotion of the Rights of Women and Children, ACWC, whereby they will be represented by 20 people, two from each member states, one representing women, one representing children. So, for example, Malaysia, during the meetings, Malaysia, I think now Malaysia is the country host for ACWC. So, the role of Subhakam remains in that being an important body combating human trafficking and migrant smuggling. And according to the Act that we are governed under, the 1999 Act, the Act 597, so how come as a national human rights institution and HRI is responsible to protect and promote human rights and in executing this role, we have among others four very specific roles in relation to TIP. One, to undertake research by conducting programs, seminars and workshops and to disseminate and distribute the results of such research. Two, to advise the government and or the relevant authorities of complaints against such authorities. So this is what we normally do. We get complaints from NGOs complaining about the state of people who have been detained, for instance. So we will go and see, you know, and see going to the centers and see whether or not, you know, there has been human rights infringement taking place and recommend to the government and all such authorities appropriate measures to be taken. Thirdly, to study and verify any infringement of human rights and D, to visit places of detention in accordance with procedures as prescribed by the laws relating to places of detention and to make necessary recommendations. <coughs> now, number four, the young people always have the thought that, oh, we can just budge in. We can't. We always have to write in nicely and then we get... Because remember, the law says in accordance with procedures as prescribed by the laws relating to the places of detention. So we are subjected to the laws and regulation of those places that we want to go. So really, there shouldn't be that fear. 
you know, of saying that, you know, we, we have such excessive powers. We don't. We really don't. You see? But do allow us to go in so that we can help whoever that needs help within and also help you to do a better job. So the activities conducted by Suhakam Dasfa, apart from being one of the pioneers in pushing for the first act, is that to have published a joint report entitled Soul Like Fish. I believe you can uh, Google this on the Suhakam website. Um, this was released by Suhakam and 45 Rights, and this report provides evidence that will help ensure justice for victims, accountability for perpetrators, and policy changes to strengthen the Malaysian and regional response to human trafficking. And this report was based on a multi-year joint investigation, including more than 270 interviews with eyewitnesses, survivors, human traffickers, government officials, and others from 2013 to 2019. It documents the crimes of human traffickers against Rohingya refugee women, men and children at sea and in human trafficking camps in Malaysia and Thailand. Receive and act on and act on complaints, something that we continuously do. From 2017 to 2022, Suhakam received 43 complaints relating to human trafficking and has completed 35 investigations. In terms of law reform, apart from uh, being part of the uh, body that, you know, uh, of, the, of the task force that led to the first uh, act, we were also, Suhakam was also involved in the amendments to the Atipsom because initially it was just anti-trafficking in persons then it became anti-smuggling for migrants um, and this was I believe amended 2010. Among the proposals is to have clear guidelines for victims indication and this is in line with article 13 of ACTIP which Malaysia ratified in 2017 and the article calls for each party to establish national guidelines or procedures for the proper identification. See, proper identification of victims has always been a challenge. Okay, and following that, the government has adopted national guidelines on human trafficking indicators. And this uh, was developed in collaboration with Council for MAPO, not local NGOs and international agencies. So Akam have also submitted inputs for the development of the NACTIP, the one that you see on the tables uh, outside uh, at the foyer of the faculty. Advocacy and promotion is something that Suhakam does uh, continuously. Um, has published a number of press statements to raise awareness on the issue of human trafficking and in the press statements also requested for the government to focus on identifying weaknesses thereby strengthening the Malaysian border enforcement infrastructure to deny traffickers any opportunity to carry out their heinous practices. Two, intensifying efforts to prosecute and convict traffickers and those abetting in such activities and to provide all forms of necessary assistance including legal aid, humanitarian humanitarian supplies and access to basic services to victims of trafficking. Periodic visits, yeah, apart from, uh, apart from conducting uh, visits because of complaints, periodic visits are also done. So in other words, you know, we say we want to have a visit and then we just go in upon getting permission, of course. And since 2020, visits have been made to palm oil plantations and manufacturing factories to investigate issues involving forced labour. During the visit, several human rights issues were identified, such as issues on wages not being paid by employers. Yeah, that's why it's so important to do these periodic visits, because then only you will find out. Because not everybody will be so um, responsive, you know, when they see advertisement and all that, they make complaints. You know, it takes quite a strong character, you know, to complain against uh, injustice that takes place against you. You know, many people suffer in silence. So when we go in and we talk to the people, then we discover all this, you know, uh, unannounced or uncomplained complaints. Okay? Uh, migrant workers being brought to Malaysia with the promise of work in the manufacturing sector, but given work in plantation instead. You know, they came with high hopes thinking that they are going to be in factory, but end up, you know, working, toiling in the... Uh, estates. So what are the rights to remedy? Right to an effective remedy consists of two elements. One is in terms of procedural, the other one is substantive remedy. On procedural, there will be procedural remedies whereby the remedies are provided during the process for the victims to be heard and decided in court. So in other words, they need to be enabled to bring their cases to the fore first 
And while going through the cases, they need to be supported as well. So this will be the procedural remedies, and of course, help with legal aid, etc. In terms of substantive remedies, it reflects the outcome of the proceedings, the relief afforded to the successful claimant. Of course, this one is actually more difficult to deliver. So remedies for victims of human trafficking is important for the victim's recovery, reinstatement of their rights, and prevention of re-victimization. Sadly, some of the victims that Swakam spoken to, they, they were not victimized the first time. You know, chances are because of their vulnerability, they have been going through the multiple victimization. Article 6 of the protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, supplementing the United Nations Convention against transnational organized crime, uh, provides guidelines on the right of effective remedy to the victims of trafficking. And according to Article 6.3, state parties shall consider implementing measures to provide for the physical, psychological and social recovery of victims of trafficking in persons. So these are the examples of remedies provided under the Tipsum Act 2007. For instance, Section 25 essentially gives immunity to victims of trafficking from criminal prosecution relating to illegal entry, etc. This is so important, isn't it? Because you are actually decriminalizing them when in actual fact, if you want to follow the black letter of the law, they would have committed multiple immigration offenses. Okay. Section 42 provides place of refuge for the care and protection of trafficked persons. Section 45 gives priority to the health of the victims in need of medical examination or treatment to be brought to a medical officer earlier instead of a magistrate. So the priority is that if one is unwell, needs to be treated first before production before a magistrate. Okay. And recent amendment to Section 51.6 grants magistrates the authority to extend protection orders for victims to record testimony, which could be used in lieu uh, of in-person testimony, thereby allowing a foreign victim to return to their home country ahead of a trial. Because as you all know, trials take a long time to even start. Or once they start, the length of the trial can be lengthy. So because of that, this is so important. Because on one hand, you want them to be sent back. But on the other hand, their testimony is crucial to the case. So future plans of actions uh, by Suakam in curbing the issues of human trafficking and migrant smuggling. So as an NHRI, Suakam will continue its mandate under Section 41 to investigate complaints involving human rights violations and will keep advising the government. This is something we do all the time, you know? I think the ministers are sick of getting uh, applications from us wanting to do kunjung hormat. Because although it, it sounds kunjung hormat, in actual fact is that we are giving you stuff that you have not been doing and that you need to do. All right? Um, so, you know, um, advise the government to adhere to the Palermo Protocols, which is a supplement to the UN Convention um, against Transnational Organized Crime 2000, and to accede to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, which we are not yet a state party that prohibits a number of practices directly related to trafficking, such as slavery, the slave trade, servitude, servitude and forced labor. And let's not forget, because it's women and children, as a state party to the UN Convention, under the CEDAW, for example, in relation to women, Malaysia is required to take all appropriate measures to suppress all forms of trafficking in women and exploitation of prostitution of women, and general recommendation number 19 identifies trafficking as a form of violence against women because it puts women at special risk of violence and abuse. The CRC, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Optional Protocol on the Sale of Children, Child Prostitution and Child Pornography in 2000, uh, of 2000 prohibit trafficking in children for any purpose, including for exploitative and exploitative and forced labor. Article 39 of the CRC requires state to take all appropriate measures to promote physical and psychological recovery and social reintegration of a child victim of any form of neglect, exploitation or abuse, which includes trafficking. The CRC also requires states to recognize the right of every child to education, Article 28, and to facilitate for the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health, Article 24. The optional protocol to the CRC specifies particular forms of protection and assistance to be made available to child victims. Now, these are all words. We all know the guidelines. We all know what are being promoted. But really, it is time 
to walk the talk together. Thank you very much. Is there any question? I don't think so, is it? <laughs> yes. The Q and A is both us together. No problem. Okay, great. No, no problem. No. The, Q, the, the, Q, the Q and A is both of us together, so no she problem. She is the walking authority of yeah, it's a fine, fine. No. <laughs> so many authorities here. That's why. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this company. It's not related to the uh, it seems that within ASEAN, uh, the legal uh, regulations and regime is quite comprehensive. However, as the trafficking uh, destinations includes like countries in South Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and all of these. So, uh, is there any uh, arrangements? Uh, the way you are within ASEAN, are there any arrangements like uh, towards beyond ASEAN also uh, in terms of legal? Regulations. Okay, thanks for the question. Very good question. Import, what fell down, I don't know. So, we have this thing called Bali process. So, this Bali process and how do I call it? It's not really an organization, but more of collab collaborative effort. Uh, between, um, I think there's more than about 20 countries or more. Um, this includes New Zealand and Australia, where, um, so, so this transcends Asian countries, um, where basically the authorities work together um, to jointly combat human trafficking. Because you know this um, trafficking transcends borders, right? It's a transnational crime. It happens domestically, it happens abroad. Mm -hmm. So um, you need to work uh, with the um, law enforcers in other countries um, for rescue purposes, or maybe you need to um, you know, um, apprehend someone or even extradite someone. Um, there is this officer here. They got number? <laughs> from Brickfields. His name is, you're the one doing trafficking, right? Ah, oh, Tuan Hisham. Oh. So, he does a lot of um, trafficking. If you want to add on, please uh, add on. So, uh, yeah, so um, there is this concerted efforts that's, that's being taken. Uh, for Malaysia, when um, there's um, any um, uh, victims, uh, or um, what I know is that firstly they look at the offenders, but uh, they are all um, victims also. When it involves foreigners, they do inform with Maputra, particularly the offenders, because you know it's not just dealing with the um, offenders or victims, but we're dealing with people from other nationals. So we need to threat very diplomatically, strategically, and lightly. Yep. Anything you want to add? No? Yep. Okay. Tuan ada apa-apa nak? Nak tambah? Nak tambah? <laughs> Put him on the spot. <laughs> Any other questions? You know why this whole program about, well, basically it's youth, not only youth. Um, mm. It's all of us, actually. Um, mm. We can be victims of trafficking. I, I always say there's never a maximum age, there's never a minimum age. Because people who can be trafficked can be trafficked, you know, um, even In before time. they were born, mm. from In their time. infant until they're old. They are traffic there's all sorts of trafficking. Trafficking of disabled people. That is very, very sad. Um, there's a lot in US, you, you know, they are disabled. So they are disabled, they are basically voiceless in that sense, very vulnerable. They can't even express their pain and suffering. They are forced to work in, you know, like turkey cooks, chicken cooks, doing all this dirtiest job, and they can't even express themselves. And then there's trafficking of the elderly. You know, there's a lot of elder abuse. And for women and children particularly, 
um, I always say to my students, it's very sad why a lot of women, why do you think mostly women, why? Female, okay, I'm told it, female, why? Okay, yeah. yes, valid, valid, yep, good, vulnerable, yep, valid, yep, fantastic, very good, yep, can you explain? Uh, for example, from sex trafficking, yep. and then organ trafficking, yep. and then labor as well. Yep, very good. That's very Multi good. Multi-purpose. Multi-purpose for women. Um, also to reproduce, for reproduction. Mm. And then the baby can be sold as well. Or the baby, when it comes out, also can be sold, um, can be used for child labor or, you know, child exploitation. Also easier. Yes. Easier to manipulate. I mean, why Make that will be? Strength. Yeah, why that will be another big program? But <laughs> I'm not going to go into that. Uh, yes. Doctor, can you just uh, share about um, trafficking the elderly? Trafficking of the elderly. The purpose, because we see younger okay, women, as you mentioned, as multi-purposes from mm. every section of their life. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But what about the elderly? How are they contributing or benefiting another you know, group or individual? Maybe not as extensive as women and children, but elderly should not be seen as the one that's in need of care alone. So you have still elderly who are still performing. You know, and they can, you know, and because they are so vulnerable as well, they can be turned into domestic aids, for instance. You know? And all those possibilities, although not as much, but you see the traffickers, anything that is profitable, they will go for it. Because the main thing that they focus on is profit. Anything that brings benefit, which is profitable, then they will go for it. Although, of course, comparatively, it will be lesser in terms of uh, quantity compared to the younger ones. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, so, just want to know how big are these uh, syndicates uh, who operate these operations? Are they as big as the double characters, or are you looking at uh, small, small groups working in different? Oh, multi level. Lots of types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. lots, lots of types, you know. That, that's why I, I truly appreciate my exposure in drafting the guidelines because there, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with very strong NGOs from, you know, countries like United States, Canada, who really work against all these uh, huge syndicates, you know, syndicates that own ships, that traffic people and not allow people to go back for tens of years because they just live in the ship for purposes of fisheries. Horrendous, you know, they are, they are, they won't be allowed to have any contact beyond the vessel, you see, and there's no opportunity at all. And to penetrate this, you know, that, that's when the movies that you watch uh, elsewhere, it's actually, there is some truth. There are some truth in it, that it is really, really very, very difficult to, to you know, to uncover this and the case. Yeah, um, I always call it a crime that is organized rather than organized crime. Because once we say organized crime, we think like oh, gang, syndicate. Yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily. That's why I always, um, uh, you know, um, I always debate this term that it's only been done by um, organized crime. No, it's not. Because okay. it's multi-level. You have this, um, an individual can be a trafficker. Can be, he can just work on his own and exploit a person that still can be a trafficker. Mm. It can be a husband and wife couple, can be you know a small group of people, or they can also be part of a larger group. And from my interviews, you'll be surprised, you know, some of um, the victims. Um, this has to do with normalization of violence also. Um, because if you see uh, most victims who are trafficked, um, most, uh, not all, a lot of them come from 
um, background of poverty mm, or you know a lower socioeconomic um, uh, background. So they are used to having hard life. Okay, they have normalized this hard life. So when they then are being trafficked, they are being asked to do all this work. It does not appear different to them or weird to them because they are like you know their lives have been hard. That's why many of them do not identify themselves as victim. They don't identify themselves. This has got to do with media as well, actually. Yeah. Stereotypes. Because we always think that, oh, you know, those being trafficked, you know, being kidnapped and everything. There's been studies done. Even in Malaysia, you go to the Tokan Tokan, they will say, why do we need to kidnap women? Why do we need to kidnap people? We don't need to do that. We, and you know how it works. Um, let's say they have um, few girls, for example, working. You know, for example, for sexual purposes. Customers, they like new faces. Okay, so this, this, let's say you have five girls who come to work. And then they say, oh, you know, I want to go home after three months. They say, okay, but you get somebody to replace you. So that's why you see a lot of recruitment, if you ask, is being mm -hmm. done. How do you know the work? Oh, you know, my cousin told me, my friend, neighbor, sister. So they will call the people from their village or someone they know and say, oh, you come and work here because she wants to go back. So she will do her part and say, oh, you know, I've been working mm -hmm. a lot. I'm going to bring, I'm, I'm a, a, a successful migrant abroad. Nobody wants to be a failed migrant. So that's the thing that they're very scared of. Migrants are very scared of being labeled a failed migrant, right? Mm -hmm. So, ah, oh, okay. So then, of course, and this is, there's really this trust. Of course, you get these things of, these odd things of like Facebook and all, yes. But usually there'll be some sort of link that somebody knows. And then they'll say, okay, come, you replace. So you, you get a replacement. And once that person comes, the other one is nowhere to be seen. They've got all these characters and, you know, all these vicious characters. So um, coming back to that organized thing, that, that, that's why I say it's a crime that's very organized. See? So, and also one of the uh, problems of victim identification is because they don't identify themselves. I interview these victims in shelter. Most of them don't, don't identify as a victim. They ask me, what's the meaning of victim? Because they themselves think that, they themselves, um, believe that mm -hmm. that image of a victim should be the one they see in yeah. TV, <laughs> but it's not. Okay? Yep. Since the whole uh, process of the traffic of human trafficking needs a uh, uh, huge financial and logistic preparation by these gangs and organizations, is there any law in Malaysia that address this illegal transaction Okay, thank you for the question. Good question, right? Mm -hmm. no. huh? for, for the general, then I would imagine that because, yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question, really, because uh, it may not be in the actual trafficking act itself. But it can be, uh, like information can actually be intercepted from the criminal procedure code, isn't it? I mean, we used to have what is called ESCA, the Essential Securities Regulation Cases, whereby, you know, uh, prosecution, police can actually intercept communication, you know, coming from whatever and use that as evidence against the perpetrator. But, but now, uh, since ESCA was abolished in 2012, we now have that provision also in SOSMA, you know, so you have other laws which may not be specifically on trafficking, but can be used for the same purpose. We have this thing called Anti-Money Laundering Act, okay? This AMLA, in short, um, we have, like uh, Dr. Farah said, we have the SOSMA, we have this POCA, although we don't really use it, we have POTA, uh, but POTA is for terrorism, but POCA, you know, Prevention of Crime Act. So basically, even lawyers, um, any undergraduate law here, who is in final year? Oh, they have None. Class. Okay, they have class. Okay. <laughs> so I teach <laughs> um, undergraduate lawyers, okay? Uh, final years, just before they become lawyers. 
So we even have this thing called know your client, KYC, meaning um, even um, uh, the law firms are all um, people who are responsible or accountable to report to Bank Negara. Bank Negara is our national bank. Um, if there's any suspicious money coming in, because lawyers are usually stakeholders. So we do have many individuals and agencies. This is actually to curb money coming in from illegal source or um, questionable source. And then we have this thing called Prevention of Crime Act that is actually, um, it's not the, okay, in terms, I'm not going to talk on human rights, it's not the best uh, yeah, forum. forum on, because this is basically detention without trial, but the purpose is to clamp down um, people who are involved in, or, you know, fi financing terrorism, um, gangsterism, um, and organized crime, which includes trafficking as well, human traffickers. So we do have actually uh, strict laws around that. Betul kan, Tuan? Nak kena check dengan practice. Ah, just double checking with the practice. But I know that that part is quite strict. Our enforcers, not because they are here, but I know for sure because I'm always shouting about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay, thank you for the question. Good question. Okay. Actually, most of the victims in our country is foreign victims. So we are actually addressing a lot um a lot of issues are um those victims from abroad. We do have domestic victims, but to a lesser extent. So Malaysia is a um uh, source to a lesser extent, transit destination, big extent. And like you know that yesterday the speakers say why they want to come to Malaysia and not Indonesia. Not saying that Indonesia is not uh, good. I like Indonesia, it's very nice. I like the food, I like the people, I like everything. But they come here because of probably because of the economy. Um, so um, the big problem is another thing is the language barrier. So um, a lot of our shelters, if you see, are being occupied by foreign victims, particularly for women and children even, those who are sexually exploited. You see, they come from abroad. Many of them can't speak English or Malay. And then, um, usually, they know somebody from their country. Now, there's another one issue they always say, why must Malaysia government allocate so much money? These people are not Malaysians. You know? That's the thing. Why, you know? They're all foreign victims. Yeah. You know why? Humanitarian issues. Humanitarian, yes. But one thing you must remember, regardless of wherever they come from, they were exploited yeah. in Malaysian land, Malaysian territory, regardless of whoever. So, because they are exploited in Malaysian territory, Malaysian land, the law of the land must apply and we are uh, duty-bound to protect them. And since we have also signed the Palermo Protocol, it's a long thing, it's trans, you know, what, huh? suppression of blah, 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 women and children, it's a long thing. We, are also, um, we also ratify the um, Convention of Transnational Organized Crime. It has three protocols there. One of it is trafficking protocol, uh, migrant pro uh, uh, smuggling of migrants protocol. The other one is arms protocol. 
the arms one we didn't we didn't ratify i think our laws are very stringent on arms here um, um we ratified the trafficking protocol that's why we have the atip so so i hope that answers yeah, your can question I just add yep. more, yeah. and also don't forget that's why the u.s embassy particularly isn't it uh, plays a huge role in in supporting malaysian government in combating trafficking for instance, this course is just one of the many which Rina has been organizing since last year, you know, or training of trainers, you know, it's, it's different purposes. Like this one is more of an awareness program. But prior to this, what we were doing were like training of trainers on, on stakeholders on how to actually, you know, identify whatever, but different, you know, different stages of the issues. But the US Embassy has started this quite long before. You know, I remember in 2019, I was invited to Langkawi to be trained as an expert witness where cases involving children. And the trainer was a prosecutor from the United States and also a Supreme Court judge. So, you know, for five days, we were trained, a small group of us, police officer, immigration officer, uh, three academics, you know, we were trained on how, you know, like, 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 macam pergi sekolah balik. You see, we have to act as a witness and all that. And at the end of it, we were shown videos and shared tapes of victims of trafficking in Kuala Lumpur, Bukit Bintang, and they come from countries like Venezuela, mm -hmm. Chile, you see, and you know for what purposes. So nowadays, I get very suspicious when you see uh, advertisements popping up on baju kurung advertisement, whatever, tapi dia punya model so cantik-cantik, you know, and obviously not Malaysians. But they seem to be happy. They look to be happy. But again, you know, because you have gone through that training, you, you tend to become very, very suspicious. And, and like Rina said, you know, it can be any of us, you know, because they can just call you and lure you and, and they are trained to do this, to meet you somewhere. And the next thing you know, you're already on the flight going elsewhere. You see? So to answer your question, some efforts are done open, openly, but many of those efforts are actually done more discreetly owing to the very nature of trafficking itself. Okay. Everyone is hungry. Yeah. Because I oh, am hungry. Uh, yes, yes, question. Um, I would like also to share, um, I work with children and I think it was three weeks ago, a girl, she's 16 in school, she actually fell off two of her classmates, two 16-year-old classmates, um, just for money. And they did not report. And when I hear this for two days, it brings a lot of other things because mm. our job is mostly prevention. Mm. It's our main core work. Um, and but she there to tell the story, who she sells it off to, you know, and all that. And to them, it's nothing wrong. It's a choice. You see, and and and, and I think this one making choices, making good available choices is important. And that's also another avenue that I think. We are trying to, all of us are trying to figure out how, just to share. Yes, exactly. Other than teaching, I shouldn't be scared. You're also teaching people who are not scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 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 I definitely agree. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, yep. I just want okay, to sure. ask, uh, so basically we do nowadays, uh, there is uh, an is male victims more sexual exploitation yep. uh, but we all know that uh, most uh, male victims will not uh, admit mm. the sexual trafficking that they have endured they will just say or they will traffic for labor mm. so but is there any um, um, like methods that are done to help male uh, victims feel more comfortable in admitting or in realizing that they are actually victims we know that sometimes uh, in the whole masculinity concept that oh, if you're really affected mm. by something such as sexual exploitation, it would relate to femininity and yep. in like very the good. toxic masculinity style. Mm, very like, good. Oh, this would make me uh, less than, less of a man. So I'm yeah. going to yeah. admit it. Mm. So is there any methods or like therapy sessions that would help deal with them with this? Yes. Thank you very much, Akasha. Social science, right? <laughs> <laughs> she come here. Oh, I just love you, my son. <laughs> Give you a stop. <laughs> it's all my area. Okay. 
Um, Dr. Farah, I'm so happy she covered this part about uh, male victims of sexual exploitation. That one also, I can have one more program on that. I see lah, got money and deep work lah. Okay, um, Dr. Farah also will speak, I will speak. Okay, basically, this is a big, big issue. Um, as you correctly pointed out, always male victims, especially on sexual exploitation, even on sexual harassment, even on rape, anything about sexuality or involves sexual problems, there's always this issue of masculinity. There's always this issue of you know being this, um, this strong man who should not be able should not be experiencing the same thing as women. They are usually predators, but not the prey, right? But simple question I always ask men, and I even tell um, my audience, basically, of course, if you see statistics anywhere, um, uh, majority of the perpetrators are male for sexual offenses. So um, majority of the victims are female. Now, uh, females are scared of males in that sense. Males are also scared of males because Predators are also males. Now, predators can be females as well. So like, um, if you see, uh, when you cover uh, uh, boys or men being sexually exploited, they can be exploited. That means they're the Johns, the, the guy, the person who exploit them or who does whatever to them can be a male, can be females as well. Of course, majority are males. So, some of this, um, um, and for children, it's even easier, you know. And they are even like in um, Afghanistan, for example, in some areas, even in the northern part of Pakistan. Um, well, now because I'm, I'm not saying um, I'm not going to refer to Taliban or anything, but Taliban has come in and has curbed all this thing. But there is this practice that uh, a very heinous practice pedophiliac kind of practice. They call it bacha bazi yeah. or dance, boy dance play. Yeah. yeah. So where um, to them, uh, girls is aura, but boys is fine. Right? It's wrong. Uh -huh. But so they, they adorn the girls like uh, girls and then they rape the boys. Uh, the boys. So here, um, you have um, cases of young boys also, um, uh, youth, um, who are being trafficked for labor. Sometimes they say for labor, they do ask the, the men to, do, um, to use them for labor, but then they are also sexually exploited. So um, your question, how do we get them to confess? That is a very tricky one because it's an issue of shame, it's an issue of masculinity, stigma, whether you know they want to actually say that they are being raped. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, we don't recognize male rape also, mm. but we are trying to push that to change the law. Um, so we do have um, under the penal code, um, uh, not under rape, we don't call it rape, but offenses that sexual in nature um, which can constitute male rape, but we don't call it that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I hope that I did answer part of that. And, uh, Farah, masuk. Inilah. Masuk je lah. <laughs> <laughs> this lecture has been lecturing since 10 o'clock. <laughs> Hence the low bat. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think, I think just, I think we should conclude, right? Yeah, um, conclude lah. Yeah, I think we conclude. Yeah, 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 true. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Um, I think th I I want to thank Dr. Rina for doing this, because really working for those who are most vulnerable and most deprived is really such an honourable thing to do, because it is the most difficult as well. You know, I always say that for people like us who are educators, we are doing the easy job. We are sharing information. We are raising awareness. You know, but the real heroes are the rest of you. You see, do you want to speak out when you suspect something is amiss? Do you want to be the defender of the person when you know something is really wrong? 
We have all the laws in place, you know, under the Sexual Offences Against Children Act. Anyone who has any information, it's very, very simple, you know, any information of any offence being committed under this act, meaning sexual offence, all right, sexual assault, non-physical, physical or non-physical, must lodge a police report, full stop. Failure to do so, you can be subjected to fine. But because not everybody knows this, people think it's okay, somebody else will do it, you know. But the purpose of such laws is really to bring cases which are embedded under the sea to the surface. You see, like the tip of the iceberg. You see, the tip of the iceberg is really representing the huge, far, many, many cases that are hidden underneath. So if that was going to be the last message that I can impart today to all of you, then that will be it. You know, always be the voice for, for those who are depraved and deprived. Because for all you know, you may be the only outlet that that person has ever. Thank you very much.